Um, so Dr. Scott Sigmund again, welcome everybody to the operating room. Uh, we're going to be doing a right shoulder. As you can see, we're in the lateral decubitus position. And today what I'd like to demonstrate is a, a, a technique of using the arthrosurface nanofracture device to create uh, bone venting tunnels to improve the uh, chances of getting good uh, tendon bone healing for a rotator cuff tear. Uh, sort of a hybrid technique uh, using uh, the principles uh, from uh, our friends over at SCOE with their single row using the Crimson Duvet. I'm a double row guy, so we'll be able to take you through that technique and uh, be able to utilize these uh, bone vents to try and hope stimulate uh, rotator cuff healing. Inside the joint here, we can see that we're demonstrating our supraspinatus rotator cuff tear. We'll again visualize that up in the subacromial space in a minute. Subscap looks pretty good. Uh, a little bit of posterior labral pathology here. I'm going to make an anterior portal. I'm an uh, inside out guy. It doesn't really matter. Um, so again, in every, every shoulder, you always want to carefully examine the biceps. Uh, I like to pull it into the joint to make sure that there's no significant uh, biceps tendon fraying into the tendon itself. We can see that's a pristine looking biceps. Uh, I don't think we have any concern here um, about the pulley system. It seems to be seated nicely. So uh, supraspinatus, tear, subscap intact, biceps tendon intact. Uh, rest of the glenohumeral joint looks pretty good. So we'll now go ahead and progress uh, to the subacromial space and analyze our tear pattern. At this point now, I've gone ahead and moved the scope up into the subacromial space. And what I'd like to do now is analyze our tear pattern, which is what we're doing at this point right now. So we can see we've got our fairly typical crescent-shaped supraspinatus rotator cuff tear. Here's our footprint, which is visualized reasonably well for us as well. So uh, nice, broad, thick tendon. So this should be a really good repair. We're going to be uh, hopefully get a very stable construct associated with this. OK, blue cannula, please. So yep. OK, so what I like to do in these situations is just to take down the CA ligament for visualization purposes. So I do like to have an anterior portal. Uh, and um, I'm not going to do a major acromioplasty. Those days are done. Again, just to, uh, for visualization purposes. So we're going to get, make an anterior working portal as well. Standard. There's really no reason for an aggressive acromioplasty in this patient because we've got excellent, excellent visualization here into the subacromial space. Okay, excellent. So I'll take a shaver now, please. So the first thing I'm going to do now with my shaver is start the process of preparing the footprint, removing any bursal tissue so we get really good adequate visualization of this cuff. And then we're going to proceed into our nanofracture technique to uh, help us uh, develop uh, a good bony bed. So we can see here under surface of this rotator cuff. Now what's interesting here, there's some necrotic tendon which I'm going to go ahead and excise so we can get the better tendon to come back down onto the bone. And now we can see our footprint very nicely. I'm going to rough and prepare this bed. I don't like to decorticate because we do want to have a nice strong construct for our uh, anchor to be able to gain purchase. Now I'm going to do a double row technique. So I do like to take out the synovial uh, fold here in the bursa. It may get a little bleeding. We'll get that taken care of in a minute. So when we go to our lateral row, we're going to have good visualization. All right. So we're really starting to get some good visualization now. And what I like to do for all of these rotator cuffs is really get a feel for what they're doing. The beauty about rotator cuff surgery is, well, as we all know, each one's just a little different. You want to establish the tear pattern so that you're not putting any kind of a repair under tension. I'll take a grasper, please. This one has a fairly uh, a decent appearance as far as its ability to uh, come laterally. Again, I think we have fairly robust tissue now that I've removed the disease tissue from below. A little bit of a leaflet. Uh, uh, tear here and a split here in the uh, infraspinatus interval. But that's going to come over beautifully and lay down onto the footprint just the way that we want it to. So under zero tension. So without a doubt, this is the type of crescent tear that we're going to bring over in a reasonable pattern. May get a little bit of a dog ear, uh, but uh, for me, I'm actually uh, not too concerned about that. Biceps tendon underneath, tracking okay. We'll just be very careful not to grab that on the way in or out. Um, so, can I see a yellow cannula, please? The other thing that we can do as well, as everybody knows, is you can go ahead and uh, visualize your tear pattern from the lateral position as well, just to verify that everything is going where you want it to go. 
Here's our tear pattern right in here. We can see that that's going to come over quite nicely. And what we're going to want to do is get down onto this footprint right in here. There's the articular cartilage margin. Uh, with our nanofracture technique, you can see a little bit of a delamination right there between infraspinatus and supraspinatus. We'll grab some of that as we go in. And uh, at this point, uh, we can go ahead and start our technique for nanofracture, and then we'll come back and look at the bleeding bone as well. So I'm going to go back into my uh, posterior uh, viewing portal again. Actually, you know something? Let's just take the uh, nanofracture device without the cannula for starters. So here's the actual device itself, the arthrosurface nanofracture device. Uh, this guitar pick is excellent device because what we're going to do is we're going to, you can see there's a slight curve here uh, where we're able to get down onto the humeral head and, and perpendicular to the actual bone itself. So you want that perpendicular to the cortex. We then bang it in with the device over here with a mallet. And then the guitar pick is a nice way of being able to disengage that from the cortex. So we're just going to go ahead and put this in in our standard uh, technique here. And uh, we're going to try and go ahead and get ourselves into a perpendicular fashion. We're going to take our mallet here and we just seat it. It's a very easy seat. Push down on the guitar pick and out it comes. As a general rule, if we can do it about every uh, three millimeters or so, that's about the, uh, the amount of uh, space between that we're looking to achieve. Now what's awesome about this device compared to a standard chondral pick is that it's only one, cent one millimeter in circumference versus a standard chondral pick which is about three millimeters. It's also got about a nine millimeter depth as well compared to three millimeters for a standard chondral pick. So that extra depth gets you down into that marrow cavity, hopefully stimulating um, some pluripotential cells to come out. And again, it's very simple. Just push up on the chondral pick and out it comes. We're going to see if we can just get around the corner here down to the articular margin. You can see we're starting to get some bleeding coming out of the tunnels, which is what we're trying to achieve. Excellent. So what we'll do now is I'm going to come back over. We like to see that bone, uh, the bleeding bed right there. So I'm going to come back over from the lateral position again look back down at our bony uh, uh, footprint. And as you can see here now, we've got one, two, three. We went for about nine holes here in this uh, uh, position here. So our footprint is well, relatively exposed as well. So um, we could potentially go ahead and add a couple more at this point, but I would feel pretty comfortable at this point that we've, we've vented the footprint uh, in an adequate fashion. So at this point, I would now go ahead and proceed with our actual rotator cuff repair as well. So go back in, uh, we're going to go back into our posterior uh, viewing cannula or portal. So now we've got our working cannulas here. Just going to clean it up a little bit. May want to put a shaver in here just to get the uh, debris field clean. So now you can see we're getting some nice bleeding there through our uh, bone vents. You can see some marrow uh, material coming out at this point as well. We're going to put our anchor here into the center of our footprint. This is a triple loaded 5.5 MyTech um, Helix Advance anchor. Getting excellent fixation here. I'm very pleased with that. So at this point I'm comfortable going ahead and passing our uh, medial row anchors or sutures I should say. And we'll grab one at a time. We have two, uh, two blues and one purple with different uh, patterns. OK. Espresso, please. We're going to use Espresso 2 technique, which again is a MyTech system. We start in the, uh, laying in our sutures at this time posteriorly. We pass our, our suture up with a needle technique. Going to reach around up here now. Grasper and first suture has been passed. Okay, uh, suture retriever, thank you. I think that's fairly posterior, so I'm going to start marching up uh, in an anterior fashion at this point. 
I can't hear you. I like to do my purples in between the blues. It's just easier for not tying uh, at a later time, recognizing what goes where. And we're just slowly advancing up the tendon. So we're going to get good capture the entire repair. And we'll pass two more sutures, and then we'll be able to uh, start tying our medial row. Obviously, uh, suture management is key. Making sure we're not grasping our biceps underneath. We carefully looked at that as we passed. And we'll see if we can get one more in. Oftentimes, actually, at this point, what I may do is just do a simple sitch on the front here for this one, which is probably what I'll do since we're running out of real estate. And then I'll clip that one off, and then we'll tie the rest of our medial row and um, then do a crisscross technique, which I like for my double rows to uh, increase on surface area. So we'll go ahead and tie this simple down. This looks like it's appropriate. Standard knot tying technique. Already closing down very nicely. Not too concerned about knot impingement with a single knot. So we're already covered over our footprint very nicely by taking the tension off with our anterior um, single stitch technique. We're not going to cut these because we're going to put this into our double row. Suture retriever, please. So we'll just reach in and grab our purples. Got them. Now we'll get our blues out of the way. So we've tied our medial row at this point. We're satisfied that we've covered our footprint. There's a little bit of a pull-up dog ear here. So what we're going to try and do is uh, tag that down a little bit with our anchor into this position here. You can have the assistant rotate the shoulder a little bit to get better coverage. Burst lock, please. That's a nice technique in the lateral decubitus position to really visualize and put your lateral anchors where you want them to be. This is the VersaLock MyTech anchor. It's uh, loaded uh, directly onto the field. You can put it exactly where you want it to. I'm going to go ahead and pop this in. We're going to find our position. We want to make sure that you're on the humeral head, which we are. I think we've got decent coverage of that dog ear. A little bit there. We'll clean that up in a second. Okay, mallet, please. You gotta come over that lip for me. We just want to verify that we're well seated, which I think we are. Locking in position. We'll now go ahead and remove this. We're gonna repeat that process here in a second. Excellent coverage of that footprint. What I like about the double row repair compared to the uh, single row is that extra compression of the entire tendon onto the footprint. Now you've got those nanofracture holes that are present there too, which are opening up to allow for uh, some healing potential cells. So hopefully we're going to get a really nice bone tendon interface that's going to allow for biologic healing. And I think that the arthrosurface nanofracture technique aids in that biologic process. Okay, that's nice far apart at this point. I'm happy with the uh, spacing there. I'm going to drive that straight on down. Good, we've seated our device. Gun, please. Because of the rigidity of a construct like this, I have really advanced my uh, post-operative uh, um, protocols, and we're really allowing these patients to uh, start early range of motion exercises immediately, post-op day 10. We're starting active assisted range of motion. I anticipate having them have near full forward flexion, uh, uh, and abduction by six to eight weeks with fairly aggressive uh, rehab. So you can see how nicely that footprint has really been restored at this point. This is an anatomic repair. We'll go back over here in a moment and uh, take a picture now from the lateral side so everybody can view what the repair looks like from this side. And that's a beautiful repair. Complete coverage of the humeral head and the footprint. And uh, that is our procedure.